of strings in musical instruments, and then you know uh, was this was leading to the development of the analysis of oscillations, which is actually one of the things that that we are using nowadays to to perform uh, a lot of the research, including in, in particular in in the case of the of my own things that I'm developing. Well, so um, I mean. In my young years, so I got a degree, I actually have a Master of, of Arts in, in playing classical guitar. And then, you know, I went on, I, I didn't work very much with that, but there was always, so after my, my ex final exams, um, I actually uh, had a, a little bit of a, a small career in singing. Um, because we, we have a, a little uh, uh, a cappella madrigal group, also we did also, uh, we planned our children with uh, genet careful genetic planning, so we did one boy and one girl, so that we are able to sing uh, four voices a cappella songs from the Renaissance, and which is the same time in which, you know, music was still with mathematics, as I mentioned before, um, and actually we still give, uh, so we gave hundreds of concerts uh, throughout the years, actually even last year, um, since now we have, we have some, some, projects of interaction between quantum physics and the arts, um, I, we performed, so the, there was a, a, a composer, she's the, uh, a teacher, uh, a professor in composition in the uh, Royal Conservatory in The Hague, and she wrote a piece for me and my family, uh, which we performed uh, um, last year at a performance of some artists, which I will, maybe I will mention later. So it's back and forth, um, and maybe it's not so strange after all, because uh, you know, when you have, I mean, often when I speak about, I try to explain what a quantum computer is, um, the metaphor which is closest to, to that is actually that you have like an orchestra. So you have your, all your, your qubits, and we will come back to what qubits are, and they all have to play together in harmony in a sense. So what is known as harmony in, in uh, um, classical music, uh, it's uh, you know, reflects into the concept of coherence. So you have to have all the different parts of a big quantum uh, system playing coherently and working coherently with each other. So this is a little bit something which is still going on today. And, uh, you know, this is something which on one end has to do with something, you know, very deep, and very beautiful because, as we know, uh, I know that in the in the in the Scientia kind of thread of this uh, of this um, uh, book fair, there are other colleagues which are also speaking about the the beauty and the aesthetic value, the fact that you know when you have a mathematical theory, it works. Of course, it has to work, but it also has to be beautiful. And it works if it is beautiful, and in a sense also an orchestra, you know, it, it, it has to work, it has to function properly with all the pieces coming together like a big mechanism. And then when it works, actually there is something of beauty which is coming out. And this is actually something which speaks to us in a very kind of uh, deep way and almost philosophical way. In fact, you know, when I started, you know, this transition, uh, it had nothing to do with uh, anything which was like this technology, quantum computers, quantum communication channels, and so on, which we, we will describe also in a moment. It was just something which was completely useless and purely philosophical. And it, it was connected to the question of, you know, is, uh, for instance, does reality exist? Does reality, are real objects existing locally here and now? And this is something which, uh, you know, uh, somehow, you know, founding fathers of quantum mechanics, like even Einstein. Einstein had some, uh, the, the only way, the only time in which he was wrong in his entire career was about quantum mechanics. Because Einstein thought that things need to exist here and now. And instead, quantum mechanics says that things only start existing after you measure them. And Einstein said, makes no sense. And he was right that it does make no sense. However, you know, it is possible to make experiments which show that he was wrong because, in fact, quantum mechanical objects behave in a way which cannot be described by thinking that they exist locally. And maybe I will come back to that in a moment, but this is something which, you know, uh, my colleague Alana Spe started investigating 40 years ago, and one day, one day his wife was, uh, you know, it was, they live in, in Paris, 
And so in winter, Paris um, used to be quite cold, so one way his wife, in a winter morning, was scratching the ice out of his uh, windshield from his car. And next to her, there was a neighbor, which was a very famous physicist, and this famous physicist was also scratching the, the ice from the car, and he was telling to uh, Alan's wife, oh, poor Alan. And she said, why? And he said, he's such a bright, intelligent person. Uh, great scientist, and she says, yes, okay, so what's wrong? And the colleague said, you know, it's too bad that he is wasting his career with this useless stuff. Because he was looking into something which had no application, and everybody thought, you know, you are not, never going to have a career in science if you, you know, uh, deal with this completely useless stuff. And in fact, he nowadays says that he would never have started any of this if it was not because he had a permanent position, so already at the age of 31, he could work, you know, he had a contract and he could do whatever he wanted without anybody, uh, you know, telling him to, to stop. And this is the very, only very reason why we are sitting today here, because if it was not for his passion for something just because of its beauty and maybe philosophical meaning, I mean, we would have nothing of the quantum technologies that we have nowadays. And as a matter of fact, if it was not for that, he would not have gone to Stockholm to get the Nobel Prize last year. Uh, together with another colleague, Anton Zeilinger, which also started for very philosophical reasons, and in the meantime he realized, which is the reason why he got the Nobel Prize, he realized teleportation. And if you think that teleportation is like Star Trek, I have to disappoint you, because uh, uh, real teleportation, you know, Star Trek, in, in comparison to real teleportation, Star Trek is boring and trivial, okay? So I can explain that later. So, I mean, this is something which really is uh, in between, a continuum between, you know, some beautiful philosophical, you know, kind of harmony of things uh, and, you know, some actual technology. And so this is what, you know, led us... Uh, uh, in, and, and this is the sort of the, my more professional part of my other side of my life, which nowadays is the, the, the biggest, so to say, to deal with, you know, how you can use these devices, how you can use these phenomena. And this is what I'm going to, to tell a little bit. So here is a, a slide in my favorite color, which is pink, uh, as you can see also from, from my T-shirt today. Um, I paid a lot of money to get a logo for our European Quantum Flagship Initiative in the pink color, okay? Uh, so this is uh, something what we are doing with our European initiative, which when I started it, uh, now six, seven years ago, uh, this was uh, considered to be, it was foreseen to be one billion euros for 10 years, and we thought that this one billion euros would be a lot of money. In the meantime, it has grown to nine billion euros, and we are still counting. And here is uh, a picture which goes to the origins, and again, to this connection between the science and something which is very mysterious and philosophical. So this connects to when I was in my first uh, week as a postdoc, as a young researcher, in the group, as was mentioned before, by uh, our moderator of uh, Professor Zoller in Innsbruck. So I wanted, it was 7 p.m., more or less like now, and I wanted to go home for dinner. Uh, so I go to the cellar, I take my bike, and I go out of the institute. And in comes a black limousine, and out of the black limousine comes the Dalai Lama, which you can see there. And His Holiness came to Innsbruck. Actually, he came to Innsbruck to discuss with Anton Zeilinger, you know, the, the famous physicist about teleportation and so on, entanglement, and we will discuss that. But then, on the way to this discussion, he went to the cellar of the institute, because in the cellar, you see there my colleague Rainer Blatt, and uh, Professor Blatt had, and still has, in his uh, lab, a little can of glass which, you know, contains something which the founding fathers of quantum mechanics thought it's impossible. It turns out that, you know, we all have learned, old people such as myself, but also younger people, and even my children, I found out, they learn in school, we all learn in school, that you cannot see a single atom with your eyes. As a matter of fact, Schrödinger, which is one of those who invented quantum mechanics, he said once, it is, uh, sometimes we think that we can make experiments with individual atoms, but whenever we think that, this immediately leads to ridiculous consequences. 
it would be more serious to imagine that we could raise a pterodactyl in a zoo. Now, nobody knows why he chose the pterodactyl as opposed to some dinosaur which is easier to pronounce. Okay, we don't know that. However, yeah, uh, he chose the pterodactyl to say, you know, forget it. There is no way that anybody can experiment with individual atoms. And he was wrong. In fact, His Holiness went to the lab of Renner Blatt and then switched off the light after taking the photo. And after a few minutes getting your eyes uh, uh, accustomed to darkness, uh, His Holiness was putting his eye on a microscope and between his eye and the center of this little vacuum chamber, this little can of glass, uh, there was only glass lenses, no fancy microscopic, electronic micro microscope stuff like that, no, very directly. And he could see, after a few minutes, in the darkness, this little tiny dot, you know, lonely and forgotten in the, in the darkness, one single atom, which was vibrating and emitting some, some green laser light. And the Professor Blatt was doing that because, as you can see uh, down on the bottom, because he wanted to make a lot of these uh, ions uh, together, one after the other, and to create a quantum computer with them. Okay? So this is something which, indeed, was thought to be impossible, and instead it works, it's possible. And now I will tell you a few words about, you know, what we, uh, we can do with that. In fact, in your pocket, and here I have also one, one device in my uh, uh, right pocket, you do have some devices which are completely impossible to create without quantum mechanics. Without quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics is the uh, uh, science which tells you how very small things uh, work, like these individual atoms, like individual electrons. So, you know, you cannot have electronics, like electronic devices, without electrons. So you need to know how they move, how they behave, and then you can create some, some you know, circuits, you can send some photons, which are small particles of light, through the glass fibers, so that you can create lasers, and you can uh, have the communication over the internet, okay? And this is something which is impossible to do if you do not know how to manipulate quantum mechanics. However, it's a digital device, it means zeros and ones, okay, bits, and it means it's, uh, you know, it's electronic, so there is an electronic circuit which is switched on and off. Off, it's zero, no current. On is one, there is current which goes through. But for each zero and one, there are hundreds of electrons which are moving around, okay? And this is the old stuff. This is the first quantum revolution, okay? So first quantum revolution, and a lot of devices that we use every day is coming from that. Now, in my left pocket, I have a device which you have not seen. You never knew it exists. And even if you do, you have never touched one with your hands. This is a Samsung Galaxy Quantum. This is the first consumer electronic device which contains uh, quantum technologies of the second generation, okay? In this case, what do you have? You know, you do not have just, you know, these many hundreds of electrons going around, um, but you have individual ones. You have single electrons. Uh, which are, or single photons, which are manipulated individually, like Professor Blatt did in his lab. Only what happens is that in this telephone here, there is a little chip, I brought it for me, for you, um, to see, it's here. So this is not the whole chip. This is in this card, you know, if you come close, you will see there is a 2.5 mill millimeter square tiny chip, which when I was, uh, you know, in that lab and meeting the Dalai Lama, uh, was something which uh, occupied three times as much this table, full of different equipment, lasers, and so on. Now it sits in this chip here, and what it does is it generates some individual photons, and these photons are measured, and they are giving a random result. So this device generates random numbers, which are necessary for encrypting. They are used to make encryption, to uh, send in a secret way, like when you want to send your credit card number to do some online uh, you know, uh, transaction, you want to buy something, you do not want that everybody can see your credit card number. This is why you do not see it via email, Zonder, but you, instead you put it in some you know, 
like HTTPS in your browser, when S means it's secure, means it gets encoded, and this requires random numbers, and the only fully random way to have such random numbers is by using a device like this. And this is something which in the last 20 years came from the size of an experiment, something very fundamental with a lot of pieces to something which is industrial, no longer science, but you can use it, you can buy it, Unfortunately, you can buy it only in South Korea, okay, because this is uh, sold by South Korea Telecom. And actually, what we want to do with our flagship is to be able to produce these devices and sell them and make um, some, some technology also, you know, in Europe and for the, for the good, for, you know, the positive uh, use of several people, normal citizens, you know, around the globe. So here is... A slide which tells you the reason why this is different from classical stuff. Classical is, we, we call classical when something is non-quantum. So here I show an example of a quantum bit. A quantum bit is different from a classical bit, so a qubit can be zero or one, such as a standard bit, but like that cube which you see there, this cube, you know, in itself, you know, you can see both with face up or face down. If you look at it, it will at some point collapse in one of the two possibilities. Of course, a quantum system is, I mean, this is not a representation of a quantum system, it's just to give an idea. It's something which contains both possibilities, and when I observe it, it will go into one or the other possibility. Now, when I have two of those, and this is a slide which I, I, I borrowed from, from my colleague Bill Phillips, who is, uh, was Nobel laureate for physics in 1997, and actually next week we are going to Rome together to the Pope, because there is a workshop at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, so, I mean, uh, he still is around, and he uses this slide to explain <coughs> when you have two such qubits. You see, I can picture them, you know, in, in this containing both possibilities, but when you look at them, I know nobody who can look at them and see one flipping upside and the other flipping downside. They both flip either upside or downside. Now, if I had two of these uh, qubits, they would be entangled, like really entangled with each other in a quantum mechanical way. And if no now I take one of those and I keep it here in Guadalajara, and then the other one I, I send to Ciudad de Mexico, then I will measure my QBT here in Guadalajara, and I will see, okay, it is face down, it's in state zero. And immediately I know that whoever is measuring the one in Ciudad de Mexico, they will find the same result. They cannot find it in, in, with face up in state one. So it is this correlation which was very puzzling. So Einstein called it a spooky action at a distance. He thought it was spooky, that it made no sense. And in fact, it makes no sense it's something which we cannot imagine how it could work, but nevertheless, it's there, it can be verified, and this is why not only Alan Aspe got his Nobel Prize last year, but also Anton Zeilinger realized teleportation. Now, teleportation, I don't have too much time to explain, maybe after, after any questions if you're interested, but as I said, teleportation in Star Trek is boring, because in Star Trek you say, beam me up, Spotty. So it means you know what is being teleported, which is me, and you know where it is being teleported, which is up. Instead, with quantum teleportation, you take something which you do not know what it is, an unknown quantum state, and you can teleport it in a place which you do not know where it is. Because this other person could have gone to Ciudad de Mexico, but maybe they have traveled to Rome, or maybe they have gone to Alpha Centauri, and you do not know where they are, and still, by using this entanglement, <coughs> you can teleport the state to an entirely different location. This is something which Anton Salinger did, and 20 years ago, this was a picture that he had when he went to the European Space Agency, and he said, look, we can use this to make secure communications. Because since the state, the system does not exist before you measure it, then it means that if someone is trying to eavesdrop to capture the information about what is this state, is it zero or one, then they cannot because the data does not exist before it is measured. So this can be used for completely secure communication. And so he said to the European Space Agency, do it, we can do that, it's a great technology. And what did the European Space Agency do? They slept on this for 20 years, so they didn't do absolutely anything. 
And then, you know, the Chinese came and they put a satellite with this in the orbit because a student of Anton Zeilinger, the first author on the teleportation paper, his name was Jan Wei Pan. And you may guess that Jan Wei Pan was not exactly a Tyrolean student, even though the experiment was done in Innsbruck. But then, you know, he went back to China, he got a couple of billions from his government, he used them to build a satellite, they put it in orbit, and they managed to do these experiments. Now, finally, we are starting to do that as well. Why? Because, as I said, we want to do quantum, uh, uh, different technology applications. And, you know, uh, there is something which is you can use these things to measure very accurately time, for instance. I will come back to that later if we have time. Um, and this is something which you can use for ultra-precise navigation, because a satellite with a very precise time signal could tell you where your car is, not only within, you know, two meters, but within two millimeters which will be enabling your car to navigate autonomously, okay? This is just one example, which can be done with, with ultra-precise clocks. Then you can use these devices, these electrons, for instance, to uh, uh, um, measure, to capture the field generated, for instance, by your brain for medical imaging. I will come back to that later. Then you can use it also, as we mentioned, we, I will explain in a moment, a little more for quantum communication. Then you can use this for you know, computing. We will also talk to, about that in, uh, uh, later on. And then for other application in sensing and also in quantum simulation. So I will say a few words on this. And this is indeed the areas, the different topics which we put in this quantum manifesto. So you know, once we realized that this was no longer just some interesting science, some philosophy, but you can use these devices, we wrote this quantum manifesto and we told the European Commission, Commission, you should invest a substantial amount of money to make progress in all these areas. And so this is what started our flagship program at European level, which uh, I mentioned earlier. So, oops, sorry. So here is uh, an example of this idea of communication. Now, I am sending from A to B, from Alice to Bob, single photons. These photons, again, are particles of light. They are quantum objects. So what happens is what I said before, if someone, some eavesdropper, tries to uh, measure that, tries to listen to what we are communicating, then Bob, when uh, he receives uh, the, the photon, will be able to, to see whether it has been changed. Because when you, like before, with this little cube, up, down, but then you look at it, it goes down, also photons, when you measure them, you modify them. When you observe, you change their, st their state. And so, the Bob can verify that indeed uh, the, the photon has been uh, manipulated. If not, they say, okay, now we can use this for secure communications. So indeed, this is something which you can put on different uh, uh, devices. You can buy these things now. I will show if we have time afterwards. We have an, uh, an entire network in Europe which we are building now based on these devices which you buy. You plug an optical fiber and you can communicate, you can send individual photons over hundreds of kilometers for secure communications. And then, of course, you know, we are also going to put this on, on, on satellites and, you know, in order to keep up with China, for instance, which is very much uh, going in that direction. Now, another example, again, you use these individual particles to do some other technology. So, we said already that we have qubits which can be in both states at the same time. So let's imagine now that I have more of these qubits. How can I use them? Imagine I am in a labyrinth. When I'm in a labyrinth and I have to find the way out, I say, okay, now let me go there, then I take a right turn, and then another right turn, and so on, and at some point, you know, I will hit a wall. So I go back, I say, no, that was not the right one. When I went right, I need now to try left. So I go left, and I try again, and then, on and on, I try all possibilities. Now, I can say right is one, left is zero, and with a classical computer, I can have a sequence of zero and one, which is left, right, right, left, and so on and so forth. At some point, I try all of them, I will go to the, to the exit. But with a quantum computer, since I am able to have this superposition, I can, in parallel, in principle, explore all of them. So in one go, I find the exit. Now, this is a little bit of a trick because, as I said, you know, if, even if I have all possibilities, 
when I look at them, when I observe, then there is a problem. I only get one result out of that. So I have to invent some algorithms which you know, allow me to use this. And in fact, this is something which um, is possible because, for instance, here, well, companies are starting to develop these things. This is a, a, a picture from the Consumer Electronic Show in Las Vegas from 2017, I think, in which, um, in which Intel was showing that they start creating uh, uh, the qubit chips, which can be used with up to 50 qubits. And then the year after, same show in Las Vegas, IBM presented a quantum computer. This is something which you can buy. Uh, you can put it in your living room, okay, because it's uh, rather large. Uh, if you have 10 million bucks, you know, uh, US bucks, you, you, you can get it. Um, it only has a few hundred qubits, okay, and it's not yet very practical, but then in 2019, Google made a chip with 53 qubits, and they found a way to have one algorithm to calculate something which with these 53 qubits, they calculated it in two and a half minutes. And at the time, the largest supercomputer on Earth with the biggest, the best algorithm to calculate the same thing would take 10,000 years. Then people found better methods so that the supercomputer now takes maybe a couple of days. But then what happens is they, um, if you, that if you add one qubit instead of 53, it's 54, you need twice as big a supercomputer. If instead of 54, you have 55, you need four times as big a supercomputer because this thing scales exponentially. Because of all the possibility that I can have with those qubits, if I add one qubit, I need a supercomputer twice as big. So in the meantime, in China, they also made an experiment in which with 60 qubits, they did something in two minutes, which the supercomputer would take two and a half billion years. So this is something which, at the moment, is for some completely useless problem, similar to the uselessness of what Alana Spey was doing in the beginning. It's purely fundamental, it's academic. And we are working to find new algorithms which can bring this to real problems. So this is the story of quantum computing. And now, also in Europe, thanks to the flagship, we have, so this is a, from a startup which was founded by Alana Spey, the Nobel Prize winner, which, you know, from fundamental scientist, he went to be a young entrepreneur, no longer so young, maybe, but uh, he's an entrepreneur, so he has this startup, and they are selling, and one of these computers will come to the supercomputing center in Uli, where I work, where we have the biggest supercomputer in Europe, and here, this will be a processor which will work together with that. Now, another aspect, so this is also a slide which is very dear to me, because when I went for the first time to Commissioner Günther Oettinger, so he was like the minister for digital things in, in, in Europe, so I went to him, I had half an hour and eight slides to convince him to give me one billion. So this was one of the eight slides, so it is worth 125 million bucks, and I am very uh, fond of this slide because it contains just one view graph, which normally you say to politicians, forget politicians do not understand anything. You know, uh, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot really explain something to them. Not true, at least the politicians that I met were quite clever people. In particular, uh, this is a picture which I took from a scientific paper published on science by a colleague in, uh, in Munich, and I showed it as it is to Commissioner Oettinger, and I explained that, you know, the, the black line is the supercomputer, again, in Jülich, calculating something, you know, a property of some magnetic material after some initial kick that you give it to it. And then the blue dots, those are the quantum simulator calculating the same thing. And you see that even though it's just a little bit, but at some point the black line is stopping. And the, because the supercomputer has no longer the computational power to do that. And the quantum simulator, the special type of quantum computer, goes on and computes further. This was more than 10 years ago. It was the first sign that we could realize such a device. And indeed, this is something which nowadays we can use also to calculate properties of materials, of chemical compounds, to develop drugs in the long term. All of this, when I say the long term, I mean that this will not happen before 10 or 15 years because you need many, many, many more qubits than those you know, few dozens or hundred that we have now. However, 
we showed that it can work. And so this is something which can bring benefit also more broadly to people wh which will use these devices which we can develop. One example of something which we, uh, already we can use, for instance, in diagnostics is, this is quantum sensing. Again, you use individual quanta, so single electrons, and your electron is the smallest magnet. We said it already before. Very tiny magnet, the smallest that exists. So if a very, very tiny magnetic field is coming, the electron goes <gasps> Because, I mean, it is extremely sensitive. So you can have the magnetic field which comes from a single neuron when it is switched on, because a neuron, it's also a very, very tiny current. So you switch on and off. It makes a small magnetic field, and the electron can catch it. So for instance, Bosch, uh, the, the, the company that, 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 that you know, uh, which is you know, making uh, you know, electrical appliances for home and stuff like that, they are creating a helmet, which we equip with these diamond uh, uh, color centers, so nano diamonds, with these individual electrons, which can detect the signal from single neurons for diagnostics, for brain studies. Another example is down there, this is a gravimeter, something which measures the gravitational field. It has been used, one, one device like this is on Mount Etna in Italy, on the volcano, to monitor the activity of the magma and to predict when an eruption might occur. And there are a lot of other applications like this in quantum sensing, so it really is you know, a broad field of many, many um, possibilities, which now, how many minutes do I have? I have 10 minutes. Oh, that's too much. Uh, wonderful, I can say a lot of things. So, uh, now what we are going to do, as I mentioned in the beginning, is we want to start using these devices and making them usable. So we want to, as I said, take these quantum computers and m make them together function with the supercomputers. In, we, we have seven supercomputing centers, which we call familiarly the seven sisters, in Europe, in which we do this and we put the uh, quantum computer or simulator together with the supercomputer to develop new ideas, to develop new algorithms, to solve new problems, and also to check because, you know, what we have in here is just uh, silicon. So all computers are made of silicon because silicon is the best technology to make a standard, a classical computer. Instead, with quantum computers, we don't know yet. Will it be atoms? Will it be superconducting uh, qubits? So devices which are cooled to very low temperatures, like Google did it, or also IBM. Will it be ions, like Rainer Blatt in the lab, which you, uh, where you saw uh, uh, the Dalai Lama? We don't know yet. There are different possibilities. We have to investigate that. So we have different startups in Europe, companies which sell these devices, and they can be put on these, on these uh, uh, supercomputing centers. This is one infrastructure that we are doing so that people can then, you know, like log in into this on some website and then use a quantum computer which we have produced in order to start playing and solving some problems. This is then another type of infrastructure that we are creating also on quantum communication using those devices that I mentioned before in order to create really a backbone like the first backbone of a future quantum internet in which we can connect different, all the capitals in Europe, and then other than on this backbone, more and more cities and applications for a series of applications for secure uh, uh, transmission of data, synchronization of, of clocks, and so on, in order, really, in the future, both with the terrestrial and satellite channels to be able to exploit the advantages of these secure communications. And then, well, here is the first, um, so on the G20, uh, um, of the, which was uh, um, two years ago in, in uh, 2021 in, in Italy, I had, you, you can see down there that uh, um, I, I was able to present the first demonstration in which we had between three different states, we had this little quantum communication network working with this small device which was able to uh, perform some video conference on this absolutely secure uh, um, channels that were secured by the communication. And now, as you can see, I have five minutes. So <clears throat> I am concluding because this is really the, a slide. I wanted to recover a slide uh, which was also the last slide uh, when, I, um, when we started five years ago our quantum flagship. I rented the Vienna Hofburg, which is the Imperial Palace in Vienna. 
it was rather expensive to rent it for one afternoon, but we had many people and we wanted to have a really a big kickoff for our flagship. And then the flagship, you know, it's a metaphor about, you know, you create a big ship. And so I found on the internet this, so someone pointed to me this uh, sentence from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, uh, which is uh, the author of the Petit Prince, uh, the, the Little Prince, uh, um, which says, you know, you, you can read it there, uh, you know, if you want uh, to make a ship, uh, it's uh, uh, about, uh, you know, you, you don't have to, it's not just about organizing people which come together and put the pieces together, but it's about sort of showing, uh, you know, and creating some, 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 some intention and some understanding that there is something beyond which is interesting, which is fascinating, which is worth pursuing in the long term. However, since I checked on the, on, the, uh, on the internet, because very often when you get such a quote, it is fake, you know, I, I checked and I found out what is the real quote by Saint-Exupéry, which is instead of this one, which I actually like best. Uh, it is from his book, The Wisdom of the Sands. And it, it is similar, but uh, it, it, it has something which, uh, uh, you know, in, in my view, concludes it's a, a very important word, um, which is connecting once again, you know, uh, science and the arts and the passion that you can have uh, for something, some scientific undertaking, and also the passion that you can have for some, for some uh, uh, um, uh, aesthetic undertaking. Um, and it is uh, that all of this is connected by one thing, and it's really remarkable, you know, that, 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 that uh, the, the, the real quote is like that, because the word community is a word that we use also in, in science to describe how we all work together towards one goal. And I find it particularly interesting that actually uh, Antoine Saint-Exupéry, when he says how you want to build a ship, he says, well, this will be based on a community of love. Of course, it is not just love between each other. It is love for something which is beautiful, which is fascinating, and which can really motivate us to move forward. And, you know, for me personally, it used to be music. It's now uh, quantum mechanics and science. And for every one of you, I'm sure there is something. And all of this, you know, can be something which will bring us forward to we don't know yet what, because if we looked 40 years ago, if we would have asked, we would have thought this is completely useless. There is, we don't know where it is going to, 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 to bring us, and this is exactly the point. If we ask, what is it useful for? Was it good for now? Then probably we would you know, drop most of the things that we are uh, starting investigating. But instead, you know, if we just pursue something because we love it, you know, most likely something good will come out of it, even though we do not know yet what it is. And with this, I think that my five minutes have come to an end, so thank you very much. Bueno, pues muchas gracias. Un aplauso para el doctor Calarco. Y bueno, ahora pasamos a la sesión de preguntas. No sé si alguien tenga alguna pregunta, la puedo hacer en español. Adelante. So the main difference, so in this case, that's a very important question because in this case, this is not yet doing any quantum communication or any quantum computing. The only difference is that there is, in this, there is this little chip which generates random numbers. Random numbers are generated also in here, but just by a standard chip um, for the purpose of creating these cryptographic keys, this sequence of numbers, which we use to encode you know, uh, like our credit card number or any message in a way that it cannot be intercepted. So in this case, you know, the chip which uh, produces these random numbers in here is replaced with this small chip. And the rest is just a standard uh, telephone. So it's a very tiny thing, a small thing. It's not yet any of the things which I described before. This will come much later. It's interesting to show that actually, I mean, this it is possible to make these devices, and actually I have brought another couple of uh, quantum chips. Wait a second, where are they? Chip, chip, oh yes. So this is 
for instance, I mean, it's small, you cannot see it, but this is, uh, I mean, making this piece of, 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 of uh, uh, electronics costs a few tenth, tens of thousands of, of, of dollars just to make it, not, not, not to research it. This is a, a chip made by Infineon. It is a, a quantum processor. It, it, you can trap in here, it's a three-dimensional structure. You can trap in here ions, like the ions which Renner Blatt showed to the Dalai Lama, and you can use them with lasers to make a quantum computer. So, I mean, it's interesting to see, even though this device is not yet uh, neither a quantum computer nor a quantum communication device, that you can actually make these things and they actually work, and this is necessary to make sure that we can bring the number of qubits to such high numbers which are necessary then to have the proper quantum computing. Thank you. Muchas gracias. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Adelante. Um, I have a question. Uh, talking about the security communication, normally it takes some time between uh, the transition technology to another, right? So it's going to take some time with, uh, when the, this technology maybe will be uh, uh, come through to, to be implemented in a global manner, right? Yes. So what can you say about the opposite possibility, meaning it seems like uh, if you had right now some quantum computer, you can implement some kind of uh, brute force algorithm to try to hack, right? So to find, uh, for instance, to crack some passwords, to crack some uh, security communication, so it seems like uh, you can try it uh, only using this brute force algorithm to break uh, the most security, the, the most of the most secure uh, system that are, are, yes. are available. So. Indeed, there is this risk that if we would have a fully functioning quantum computer, this could break the current uh, uh, encryption methods because it could solve a problem which, uh, you know, uh, factoring, finding the factors of a number, which is, would lead to uh, breaking the security of the current encryption methods. However, luckily, uh, this quantum computer would require many millions of qubits. And as I said, we are just at the level of a few dozens or maybe a hundred. And it will take, as I also mentioned, 10, 15 years before that comes. So if we just sit and do not do anything, you know, maybe the quantum computer, maybe we will not even be able to make it ever, okay? Because it may be too difficult. Or we can do this in 10, 15 years, and if we just don't do anything, then at some point it may be able to break those uh, codes that we have now. And interestingly, not just uh, the future communications, but it could also break today's communication because you can just save, you know, uh, 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 the bits which are being transmitted today, and in the future, if you can decode them, you could retroactively know whatever had been communicated in the past. So we want to avoid this, and in fact, one way to avoid this is using quantum communication because these individual photons that you send, even if you have a quantum computer, you cannot break that. But on the other hand, there is also so-called post-quantum cryptography. So other methods which are based on classical computers to create encryption and security in a way that cannot be cracked by a quantum computer. So there is already nowadays, so a couple of years ago, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US has started a process, a competition for proposal of different methods to do that. They have now selected, there were several dozens proposed, now they have down selected two of them, which seem to be still resistant to a quantum computer, and once they have proved that completely, then they will start implementing this, and as you say, it will take time, it may take like five years, but in any case, it will come before a quantum computer is, is functional, and so we don't have to be worried about that to the extent that we act, that we developed the corresponding technology nowadays. And indeed, this is one very central problem that we are addressing right now. Alguna pregunta más? Alguien más? Tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más? Nadie se anima? Ay, adelante. Uh, hola. Eh, yo estudio farmacia y este, pues me gusta mucho 
saber sobre este tema, pero me cuesta como concebir cómo funcionaría esta tecnología aplicada a drogas o a fármacos. Uh, sí, sí, sí. Igual bueno, entiendo inglés, pero para... No, 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 no hay problema. Sí, um, so, uh, well, the point is, if I want to uh, understand how a molecule, for instance, for creating some drug functions, then, you know, normally nowadays we synthesize it and we test it on different animals, humans, and so on. Why? Because we cannot calculate how this molecule, what are the properties, right? Mm -hmm. If we would be able to calculate that, you know, how it interacts with the environment, what it does, what is its chemistry, then we could save, you know, experimenting on animals, humans, and so on. We could develop much more quickly. However, as we know, calculating how a molecule functions is extremely complicated because the molecule is made of atoms, those are quantum mechanical objects, and so to compute them, you know, we need huge computers, and already after, as, as you certainly know, after two or three atoms, I can no longer calculate exactly. But here is the idea. If instead of a classical computer, I use a quantum simulator, in my quantum simulator, I can take those atoms, as I said before, which I now know I can manipulate them, I put them in a structure which mimics the structure of my molecule. But only I can control it, okay? I can create a certain geometry and how the atoms interact, and then I can observe how this system, this synthesized system works, and this will tell me how the real system will work. So it's a quantum simulator, and so this would by using atoms to reproduce, you know, in a controlled structure, to reproduce the uh, behavior of atoms in a chemical structure, it will enable us to get the properties of that in, in a more efficient way. So this is the basic idea how it would work. Muy bien. Bueno, pues les agradecemos a todos su participación, su asistencia y les pido un fuerte aplauso para el doctor Carlos.